Thank you, Tricia Keegan. Our next speaker, Laura Ross. Laura Ross is a cardiology physician assistant at the Park Nicolette Heart and Vascular Center near Minneapolis. She, gra she graduated from Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science in Chicago. She has been elected to the ACC Interventional Leadership Council, executive board member for the Association of Physicians Assistants in Cardiology and the Minnesota ACC Chapter Council. Please welcome Laura Ross. Everybody, I'm thrilled to be here and to be in an in-person conference is just fantastic and um, heart disease is a cause very close to my heart. We have a relative who at 102 had been hospitalized many times with heart failure and was told he was too old for anything living in a small town in northern Minnesota and thank goodness he ran across someone who was like there's this new procedure called a TAVR, let's see how you do. And he lived until he was 107 with only one more heart failure admission after that. So I, all these talks I dedicate to Millard. He was just such an inspiring person. He did have to downgrade from the banjo. I know you're, many of you are music lovers. It was a little too heavy as he got over 100, so he switched to the mandolin and would play for the old folks in the old folks' home. So um, I thought you might appreciate that story. Well, yes, I am also very passionate about food as medicine. So we know food is fuel. And you have heard so many great speakers today talking about imaging tests, talking about surgeries, talking about importance of cardiac risk factor management. And that's so important in the short term. But what I really hope to inspire you today is to think about, you know, so many of you have made decisions about your aortic health. What else can we do to protect you head to toe from strokes and heart attacks. And I think food as medicine is an important part. Otherwise a perfect match. I have a twin brother who is a cowboy and it recruited me to work on a cattle ranch in Wyoming for three summers, a vegetarian, if you can imagine. So I really learned that an all-or-nothing approach is not necessary to see real benefits. And in fact, in my own family, we have a family history of early heart disease. So my twin brother, although he looks like a cowboy, horrible cholesterol, borderline blood pressure. And my husband, who runs marathons, his dad had a heart attack, his first heart attack at the age of 35. So I had a vested interest in figuring out how to lower his risk. And in those personal experiences, cutting out Mountain Dew, um, cutting back on processed meat like bacon and things like that, both of those men in my life did not need medication. So I was excited to share that with my patients. I've been at Park Nicollet for almost 20 years. And over the years, started to collect some recipes, made a grocery shopping list, and surprisingly found significant drops in blood pressure, sugar, and cholesterol. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. And let's see, is this to advance the slide, I bet? Maybe? Green. Oh, that's okay. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. Am I missing it here? Ah, thank you. So, chronic disease is a big issue. Over 133 million Americans have chronic disease. Now, 80% of that is because, because of lifestyle factors. That's three in five adults. And it comes at a huge cost, $3.5 trillion, and 90% of our spending is on chronic disease. 80% of, of it being preventable. So we all know smoking is a big risk factor. And in fact, worldwide, annually, 8 million deaths can be attributed to tobacco use. But poor diet is 10.9 million deaths globally per year. It's overtaken tobacco as the leading cause. And as you'll see in these slides, the top causes isn't McDonald's, Burger King, and Culver's. There are other causes, actually, things we're not eating enough of, the good stuff. So we'll talk about that. And red meat, I think most of us know that's associated with cholesterol. But there's a big increased risk of um, also diabetes. So there's a study that showed people who eat two servings or more of red meat have a 40% greater risk of dying from a cardiovascular event. So just cutting back on how much meat you eat a day. And half a serving of red meat a day, an extra half serving, led to an increased diabetes risk by 48% kind of staggering. So I really wanted to dive into this more for my heart patients and for my family history as well. And here are the leading, four leading causes. It is 
not enough fruits and vegetables, not enough nuts and seeds. In fact, the Mediterranean diet recommends at least 30 nuts a day, about a fourth of a cup. We're not picky. Whatever kind of nuts you want, you're going to get vitamins, minerals, fibers. It's like God's perfect gift of the balance between fiber, fat, and protein to make you feel full and have these minerals that are hard to get other ways. And then not enough whole grains. The low-fat fad and low-carb, you may have heard about this keto diet that's been around. Short-term, there can be good effects. People lose weight pretty quickly. Their sugar can go down. But there's no long-living population that survives on the keto diet. It's horrible for cholesterol. And in fact, if you don't eat enough whole grains, that's another thing, risk factor for not only heart disease, but GI cancers. So I think of fiber as something that soaks up cholesterol. It soaks up toxins. And then it scrubs out your arteries and your colon on the way out, preventing those cancers and heart disease as well. And so if some of you have read The Blue Zones by Dan Buettner, he talks about these pockets around the world where people live long until they're 100s without chronic disease. And there are a couple things these communities had in common. Plant-based eating or plant-forward diet, including some fish, was one of the main things that tied these communities together. Now, interestingly, the one population in America that fit the Blue Zones was not Minnesota. I don't know why. But it was actually in Palo Alto, California, where they had a pocket of Seventh-day Adventists who don't eat meat for their religious purposes, and they reached the blue zone, um, zone without chronic disease. So I think it's fascinating. And so if we talk about modifiable risk factors, we're just not talking about lowering the cholesterol, lowering your sugar. It's actually preventing deaths. Now, most of us grew up with that food pyramid. I still can't really remember what's on the bottom, what's in the middle. Um, but we thankfully got an update to the Harvard plate. And this is how you describe it to patients. Half of it should be fruits and vegetables, and more vegetables than fruit. About a fourth of it should be that whole grain. Now, it's, they've made it easy. You don't need Instapots to make whole grain anymore. You get those little microwave packets that you tear the corner, put in the microwave for about 90 seconds, and you have a couple cups of barley, brown rice, quinoa, seven grain blend. This is what helps soak up our cholesterol even without our blood sugar, and helps get rid of the toxins. And so adding more whole grains. And then a fourth of a plate should be a lean protein. Now, beans have been around forever. That's a great, cheap source of protein and fiber. Lean meats, I didn't invent this phrase, but I love it. They say, think of meat like a condiment, or a condiment, something to have a little bit of flavor on the side if you want to sprinkle it on top, but it no longer should be the center of our plate like it was when I worked on a cattle ranch. Um, so that's one way. And fish, fish at least three times a week is what's part of the Mediterranean diet. And so trying to incorporate, what are some other plant-based proteins? There's a lot of um, meat substitutes now, Impossible Burgers at um, Burger King and chick patties, you know, made out of wheat gluten. And it's easy now, than, easier than it used to be. I think those are great for, as, as a busy working mom, I love the, the plant-based chicken nuggets and things like that. They're a great transition. And, and if we think of food as kind of a totem pole, I really don't think of food as being bad or good. It's just what's healthier and maybe not as healthy. And so when you are looking at what your choices are, what's a healthier choice for that day? Definitely a plant-based chicken nugget versus um, you know something else that, that might have more cholesterol and, and more processed stuff. So then I, when I meet with patients um, in, in my cardiology clinic, I really want to find out their why. Are they really passionate about the environment? I had a patient who was in his 80s, and every time he came, he'd want to talk for hours about global warming. And I love, it was very stimulating, but I was like, I have another patient. I finally kind of talked to him about, you can make a difference by eating more plants and less animal products. And we finally found that middle ground. You know, and when you think of a goal, the SMART goal is an acronym, so the S um, make it specific. Think of one thing you can do starting today to increase your intake of more plants and less animal products. Make it specific. Write it down. Make yourself accountable. Tell someone in your home. Um, get an app that helps keep track of things. Find a pet you can be accountable to. Something like that. And then make it measurable. Something, you know, when I meet with my patients, we pick a couple goals they're going to work on. I say, I'm going to have you come back or call me in two months. Where's your cholesterol at? We'll check it. Where's your blood pressure at? We're going to talk about it over the phone. So there's something measurable, and it's time-bound as well. And make it relevant to that why. You want to lower your glucose. You want to be on diabetes medications. How can we get to that same goal? And then, um, and then make it achievable. 
we can't say our goal is going to be to run a marathon on Friday, right? That's today. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> so kind of trying to work together on that. So based on all that information, I started something called the Heartbeat Clinic. And I went to my leadership and say, hey, I have about 40 patients. I've tried this on. All of them have had heart attacks before or had risk factors. Look at these great results. But I need to be a little more than a one-woman show. And they said, sure. You figure it out, and we don't have any money. So good luck. And <laughs> so I, I'm creative. I'm a little persistent. Um, and so... I worked with our employee well-being team. So they had health coaches, they had dietitians, they had staff that knew much more about statistics than I did. And so we decided to make this official and do an a eight-week pilot study. And I love this quote by Michael Greger. He wrote the book with a catchy title, How Not to Die. Sounds good. And he said, we should all be eating fruits and vegetables as if our life depends on it, because they do. So keep in mind, it isn't don't ever eat a cheeseburger if that's your favorite thing. It's just eat more plants. That really is what I hope you take away from this talk. And so this is the pilot study. We just enrolled employees because our coder knew they had our employee insurance and could double check every lab I ordered, every visit that we had, and really make sure we were being reimbursed. Um, and then we also, oh yes, they, my uh, um, leadership said you, you have room for maybe between 30 and 40 participants. And within 36 hours, we started a waiting list. There were so many people interested. And look at that timeline, September to November of 2020. So you may not remember that far back, but we had a pandemic. We had no vaccine. There was a little bit of a contentious election. And now we were working with employees at a hospital during a pandemic. And yet, you'll see, our results were really positive. So I like to say that. And again, the no funding. Um, at the end, we found out the dietitian visits Every participant met with a dietitian, and depending on your insurance, the cost came back at over $500. It broke my heart, especially because we had no funding. So I quick did some grant writing, and we did get a couple of the, uh, those patients reimbursed. But I really learned our health system has a lot of work to do, as many of you know, um, to play, pay for the forward care and prevention versus We'll pay for it after your heart attack. And here's an outline that we sent to our patients. I'll review in a little more detail. We really decided to make each week about one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. We'll talk about that more in a minute. They all met with a cardiology PA. I recruited a few of my friends who were passionate about food as medicine as well. We had bonus sessions, so I'm a little bit scrappy. I went right into hy V. I I heard they had a dietitian and said, hey, will you do a grocery store tour that we'll film during the pandemic and show people? Where do you find nutritional yeast or coconut aminos or jackfruit pulled pork? Those sorts of things. I went online and found a vegan chef who did cooking demonstrations. Um, and so we really tried to be creative in how we did things. Okay. Tease me, there we go. So the first pillar of lifestyle medicine is a plant-predominant diet. So really, uh, most of the visit with the PA and the dietitian was talking about what their concerns are, what are they doing now, what are some achievable goals they can do for the future. And then we had a dietitian talk about nutrient density of food, uh, how to avoid the blood sugar roller coaster, how do you feel full without eating meat. My mom still thinks it's a, fa a fad that I might die not from protein deficiency. <laughs> so there's a little education to do within my own family. And then we had our cardiologist, Dr. Pawan Hari, talked about um, kind of his experience with food as medicine. The next pillar was regular physical activity, so finding joy in movement. Just um, on Wednesday, we're doing another heartbeat round right now. We had one of the um, yoga instructors teach a salsa dance, and we had all 40 participants doing salsa in their living room, and, and they, I haven't done that for a while. We had so much fun. So what can it, it doesn't have to be, you know, running on a treadmill. What can you do to find joy? And our cardiac rehab head um, talked about finding joy in exercise. Restorative sleep. So sleep is so important in feeling good for the next day from healing from surgery, for handling stress, 80% of pain control is getting a good night's sleep. And so what temperature should your room be? Um, how long before you go to bed should you would avoid blue light? You know, about an hour, by the way, um, to really get into that deep restorative sleep. And then stress management, we had a psychologist from um, Regions Hospital, who's a sister partner with us, um, talk about stress management during a pandemic. Uh, avoidance of risky substances. We have a substance misuse program at Regions. So one of their therapists talked about that. We have a mocktail demonstration next week. We'll send out the ingredients and we'll make mocktails together. Um, and then positive social connections. They met 
with a life coach who really talked about that importance during a pandemic. How do you still make those connections? And then here's kind of the roadmap. So everyone got surveys before they started the program. We're in our second round now, talking about what's your food intake like, um, what's your mood, how's your sleep quality, how's your interpersonal relationships. And then after the program completed, they filled out the same survey. Then they, everyone met with a dietitian and PA, like I mentioned, and then we printed out a two-week menu plan None of the recipes were more than five sentences, and on Instacart, it was less than $200 for a two-week um, menu plan. And we said, take what you like. About 90% of what we cook is nine recipes. And so even just incorporating three or four new recipes in your repertoire that are plant-based can make a big difference. Um, and then podcasts and books and um, documentaries. I mean, I thought maybe a little more information than not enough. I mean, the information's out there, but to get it from a trusted source in your cardiology department, I think, was a little more unique than Dr. Oz or whatnot. Um, and then we did the weekly meetings with the Pillars of Lifestyle Medicine I mentioned, and then they did small groups of three to five people met with a health coach to kind of talk about what are their goals. They reviewed the book Atomic Habits. How do you go from coming home from work laying on the couch and watching Netflix to coming home at work, putting on your tennis shoes and doing something. So this can't be all covered in one visit. So I was so appreciative for the employee wellness program to help me with that. And then the bonus sessions that we mentioned. And so after that spiel, what we found is about 80% of our participants said most days or every day they did plant predominant diets. And about 20% was a few days a week. So there was no mandate on what they had to do. It was really patient-defined, which is a little unique in the literature, but I think much more sustainable for our meat and potatoes uh, Midwest. And by the way, I was born at Methodist Hospital where I work now, so I have a vested interest in this community. And so what you'll see is there is a, almost a 50% decrease in those who ate an average of four to six servings of animal products a week, um, from almost 11 servings a week down to 3.25. And there was a 41% increase in those who ate an average of four to six servings of plants, up from 6.8 servings to 10.3. So those humps really changed in the right direction, which we were hoping so after that education. So after all that, what did we find? 100% of our participants saw an improvement in something, some objective measure, whether it was numbers of their cholesterol, their BMI, or body mass index, what's an appropriate weight for your height or their sugar. Um, and then, I can't quite read that, 63%, I think, of participants moved from an unhealthy range. So in healthcare, we have parameters for what's their LDL goal, what's the HDL goal for good and bad cholesterol, what's their systolic or top number of the blood pressure goal, what's the bottom number of blood pressure goal, what's their ideal body mass index. And 63% move from an unhealthy range into a healthy range. There's no medication that can help us do that with very limited side effects, right? So 70% of patients improve their blood pressure. 71 improve their LDL or that lousy cholesterol carrier that brings cholesterol and packs it into the arteries. And what was fascinating to me, because I had never talked to anyone much about sleep other than sleep apnea, was that 70% of our participants rated their sleep poorly prior to the program a complete shift to 70% rating it positive after the program. And there's some thought that meat or animal products can promote some inflammation. For some people, they notice some sensitivity to dairy and whatnot. And so how is this all connected that we could see improvements in all these things? And so we had our uh, paper published just a few months ago looking at the significant differences we found in the study. So um, over 70% improved their their LDL or bad cholesterol, an average of about eight points. That was statistically significant. And over 60% uh, improved their cholesterol with a difference of almost seven points. Over 70 improved their blood pressure. Now what was fascinating is that the st systolic blood pressure measures how high is the pressure in your arm when your heart pumps the blood out. Dropped five millimeters of mercury. That doesn't sound like much, but at a recent cardiology conference, there was a big study that came out that was hailed as a huge success called looking at renal denervation, where they take out the nerve that goes to your kidneys to help control blood pressure. And it was hailed a success because it dropped the blood pressure five millimeters of mercury. So you can do that or eat more plants. I think one sounds more, a um, little less side effects. And then we did see some drop in the diastolic blood pressure and um, weight, but it wasn't statistically significant. 
And so how about some of those other fluffy measurements, you know, that, that I care about but don't get a chance to really look at with patients as much. So how they perceive their general health significantly improved pre-program and after-program. Up to 17% people said they described their general health as pretty good. I'm just going to step out here a little. And then um, the... Fatigue, more people describe that as feeling, um, less people describe fatigue. And then describing their physical health, only 3% said it was excellent before the program. That jumped up to 25% of participants said it was excellent after the program. And then social and mental health measurements, you can see the right movement and more people describing that as excellent pre and po you know, moving from pre to post um, intervention. So satisfaction with relationships and mood. And then here's the sleep quality graph where you can just see it went from um, poor um, to terrible to good to excellent after the program. And then we had a chance to ask them about other things like, how's your energy? 60, over 60% said their energy improved. How about your mood? Over half said their mood improved before and after the program. How about your clothes fitting differently? 47% said their clothes fit better. And then 17% said their physical pain or discomfort improved. And for most patients, that was arthritis type pain. Now it was interesting, they were doing another lifestyle medicine um, project at one of our other hospitals, and we had more pain improvement with a big focus on food as medicine. Um, compared to the, the program aimed at chronic back pain. So I thought that was really interesting. And then the 22% who said other improved was really GI symptoms, heartburn, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, things like that. And here are some of my favorite quotes from, from participants. So we saw, you know, all my cholesterol numbers improved. I learned new recipes, less joint pain. A couple people lost more than 10 pounds, although on average um, it, was, it was just a pound or two. And, and I love um, the second to the last one is my LDL um, improved significantly because this is a patient who had had a heart attack who's already on two cholesterol medications, and we were thinking about adding an IV expensive injectable medication and for the first time after this program her LDL is to goal she no longer qualified for the medication and then the last patient um, is a great employee who has a disability that makes it hard to cook for himself and so in reviewing the resources um, my sweet family tried all these meal delivery service uh, programs and, and I had shared with him Hungry Root which sends pre-cut vegetables and proteins and sauces to your house. Everything takes less than 10 minutes, and he was able for the first time to kind of cook for himself and dropped his cholesterol and weight and felt much better. So we've shared this on the Whova app. This is a list of resources that I've worked on with American College of Cardiology, um, as well as in my own practice, really looking at what are some digital resources from the National Lipid Association, from the American College of Cardiology, um, the uh, Association of Black Cardiologists has this beautiful PDF that has great recipes from the South. And then looking at um, other resources, I wrote Rooted Green Wellness is a fantastic resource we have in Minnesota. It started by um, a man who had his heart attack at Regents Hospital. And after that, totally changed his life around, lost 50 pounds, reversed his diabetes, got off a lot of medications, and he and his wife started a wellness um, clinic where it, uh, we have done a couple projects together to help walk employees and patients along this healthy journey. And they have free webinars and free classes, some with low cost, but generally a great deal for your money and can walk you through that journey. And they're hilarious, which always helps. And then I also wanted to point out um, the last one, the big switch. So if you're looking for a, for a change, this is a free website where you type in, I like spicy food or I can't handle Thai food. What's your cooking level, expert or novice? And it will come up and populate with cooking videos and tell you what recipes to buy. So you can cook along with them and kind of learn some new skills and recipes, um, which is great. And then one thing that's not on here, if you're looking for a quick and dirty version or, or, or overview of why would I want to eat more plants, there's a Netflix documentary called Forks Over Knives. They have a website as well, which talks to the scientists who did the China study who started to really understand this correlation between food as medicine and a journalist who makes some of these changes and how he feels and how his labs improve. Um, so it's really fascinating. Talks about the environmental impact. So 
to get the quick version in a little over an hour. It's a fun date night. My favorite snack, by the way, is popcorn, because that counts as a vegetable. Um, and then you put butter-flavored olive oil on top and sprinkle it with nutritional yeast, which is kind of like Parmesan cheese. It's kind of salty, has all the B vitamins, um, but without the sodium part of it. So that's a good snack to watch that movie. And then let me see here. Oh, yes, at the end is um, the meal delivery services. So some are meals that are frozen. Um, Sweet Earth is another brand they sell at Super Target that has five servings of vegetables and whole grains in every one. So that's a great way if you need something quick. But Hungry Root, again, is the one that a lot of my patients try. They've got edible cookie dough with chickpea flour and black bean brownie batter and cauliflower chips along with their meals that you can order. And, and they have teriyaki salmon or organic chicken if you're interested in, in including that as well. So I know that's a lot of information, but I really appreciate the opportunity and I hope I've inspired you to pick one to 10 goals. Maybe we'll just stick with three. Um, goals of things you could do. Try a plant milk. Try eating 30 nuts a day. Try um, you know, incorporating more vegetables on your sandwich or eat a side salad. And those are ways we can see it can make really big changes. And so I thank you for your time. And I'll stay for question uh, q and A. I I don't know if we should do that now or later. How are we doing on time? Yes. Oh, thanks. I'm so glad you asked. You read my mind. So I thought the same thing, and I asked our health partners insurance, which our um, employees have, and they said, we don't cover the HSCRP, which is an inflammatory marker thought to be sensitive to the heart arteries, which is ironic because it's considered a risk-enhancing factor in the guidelines. But I did get a grant, and we checked it on everyone in this round. So I will have the answer for you later as far as the HSCRP. But that's the, that's the main inflammatory marker we check this time. Are there others that you're thinking of we should include? Yeah. Okay, we'll be in touch. <laughs> I think it will be fascinating. There's a lot of studies that a vegan diet can lower these inflammatory markers, and I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic we're going to see that it will come down just with eating more plants and a little less animal products. Any other questions? That was a great one. All right, well, thank you for your time. Oh, we have another one, yes. <laughs> a number of years ago that your taste buds can change as you get older. And I, I'm a notoriously picky eater, and so I'm not a huge fan of vegetables. <laughs> so are yes. vegetables one of those things that as you get older, there's, there's still some hope that maybe they will start to taste good? Or is oh. it kind of like, you know what, that ship has <laughs> sailed. Oh like, gonna <laughs> what a great question. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to answer this <laughs> because the short answer is yes. But the long answer, the longer answer, is that it takes three to four weeks for our taste buds to change in regards to how much sodium we eat. That's pretty well studied. As far as other foods, we can assume it's the same thing. And the nice thing about vegetables is you can put them in the air fryer for a different texture. You can roast them. You can cook them. You can blend them up and put them in zucchini bread. You can eat it in different ways. They now make so many vegetable chips that have whole grains and then lots of other things in there too. But I would give it a good three to four weeks in cooking it in different ways. And there's so many vegetables. It doesn't have to be Brussels sprouts if you don't really like that. I think frozen peas are cheap, full of protein. I put them in my pasta. I put them on my salads. I'm such a mean mom. My kids call them frozen green popsicles, and now they think they're pretty cool. Um, so however you have to trick your mind into eating it somehow, um, putting it in soup sometimes is a little more palatable. So that's a great question. There is hope, definitely. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, great. Thank you so much for the opportunity.